Welcome everyone. My name is Lynette Roth and I'm the Daimler Curator of the Bush Risinger Museum and the head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. And I'm gonna be serving as moderator later on. Before we begin today's program, the Harvard Art Museums acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people. And we at the university strive to honor this relationship. I wanna thank you all for joining us for this week's session of our series, Art Talks Live, which offer up close look, uh, looks at works from our collection with our team of curators, conservators, fellows, and graduate students. And you can join us every other Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. for these short interactive talks, which investigate artists' materials and techniques, which is gonna be our focus today, uh, reveal our latest discoveries, offer a fresh look at old favorites and explore big ideas using the collections of the Harvard Art Museums. And just very brief logistics. I know we're all very good at this by now. We're in the webinar format in Zoom and you can enter any questions you might have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Today's presentation will last approximately 15 minutes and then we'll dedicate the last 15 minutes to Q&A so that we can end promptly at 1 p.m. Uh, and now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Julie Wirtz. Julie is the Beale Family Postgraduate Fellow in Conservation Science in the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies. And she is going to speak to us today about how technical study can help us better know the unknown makers of Egyptian textiles. Julie's talk is part of our series related to a museum-wide initiative entitled Reframe, uh, which is uh, reimagining the function, role, and future of the university art museum. Reframe examines difficult histories, foregrounds untold stories and experiments with new approaches to the collections of the Harvard Art Museums, reflecting the concerns of our world today. Uh, and actually I should mention that Julie's talk is the last in the Reframe series of art talks uh, uh, for the rest of the summer. And we will reconvene uh, that series then in the fall with the start of the new semester. And so with that, uh, I turn it over to Julie. Thank you, Lynette, for the introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. And thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, today, I will be taking you through some of the close looking and analytical techniques that were used in the technical study of these archaeological textiles from the first millennium CE to show you what we can learn both from these fascinating pieces and about the people who made them. The study that I'm going to be talking about was done for an upcoming exhibition called Social Fabrics, Inscribed Textiles from Medieval Egyptian Tombs, which will open at the Harvard Art Museums in January of 2022. Curated by Mary McWilliams, the Norma Jean Calderwood Curator of Islamic and later Indian Art, the exhibition explores how people of different backgrounds and religions interacted at this time through the lens of the textiles they made. Objects in this exhibition come from the Harvard Collection, as well as the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Cleveland Museum of Art, Dumbarton Oaks, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they were made primarily from the 4th century to the 12th century CE. The textiles are a record of the interchange of weaving and embroidery techniques, the availability of new materials, and how followers of Christianity and Islam lived among each other at this time and place. And these are a few of the pieces that will be appearing in the exhibition. Textiles often appear in collections as art objects. As humans, we enjoy adorning ourselves with interesting and attractive things, which puts textiles in a, in a position of both decorative and functional. Textiles are inherently fragile objects and tend to not last as long as more durable materials like sculpture or even oil paintings. They are particularly susceptible to damage by light exposure and fluctuations in humidity. The warm, dry environment of the Egyptian desert enabled a higher rate of preservation relative to most other climates. Due to the age of these pieces, it is usually impossible to tell who made a particular textile. 
The uncertainty of early archaeological practice also means we frequently lack good documentation of provenance, context, or burial environment. We may never know the names of the people who spun, dyed, and wove to decorate these textiles, or the identity of those with whom they were buried. But their preservation leaves us a valuable material evidence to learn about how they lived, worked, and were honored in death. Although there are many questions that may remain unanswered, we can still learn a lot from these pieces. Examination by microscopy of a whole object can tell us about weave structures, showing how the maker crafted the textile from various yarns, or perhaps how things were embroidered. Looking at a small sample of fiber can show us how the source material and extracting the dye can tell us what a dyer might have used to prepare the yarn before it went to the weaver. Cross sections of small samples can also provide useful information about certain decorative elements, as you will see later in this talk. It is important to start any study with a slow, close examination of the object. This piece, a cuff band that would have been attached to the sleeve of a tunic, shows a pattern of animals woven in purple on a plain ground. At the bottom left is a magnified view of the roundels with animals, which include hares and lizards. The weaver made it as a tapestry with tightly packed rows of horizontal yarn that completely cover the vertical yarn, like this. At the bottom edge, near the center, highlighted by the white box, is a small area of damage. Under magnification, shown here, the damaged area allows us to see more about the weave structure and how the textile was made. This image shows the structure of the warps, or the vertical yarn, and the wefts, the horizontal yarn. Warps are the yarn that run the length of the loom, through which the weaver adds wefts in an over-under fashion. In this piece, there are two kinds of weft present undyed natural yarn and dyed purple yarn. The damage to the wefts here leaves the warps exposed, which would otherwise be hidden in a tapestry weave. The type of weaving we're probably most familiar with is a plain weave like you'd find in sheets or perhaps a button up shirt where it's a one-to-one -one over under. So this is a little bit of a different technique and it creates a thicker, heavier fabric with less flexibility, but a lot more durability. We can see here that the warps are slightly yellower than the wefts, which may indicate a material difference. At the bottom of the gap over here, intact warps wrap away from the face of the textile. This indicates that this is an original edge, otherwise known as a selvage. The term comes from self edge, where the textile naturally creates a finished end rather than loose ends. This shows that the tapestry piece was woven separately and then attached to the garment afterward, which would perhaps allow the wearer to detach it from the tunic and put it in another garment later on. So it's basically a heavy band that you would use to decorate a more simple garment. The diagram on the right here shows the structure of a tapestry weave, again, with vertical warps and horizontal wefts. The green box, on the object here, highlights a color transition on the microscope image and correspondingly in the structure here where you can see the two colors loop away from each other like that. The blue box shows a selvage edge. Granted, this is actually the edge of a gap in the textile, but it allows you to see how the selvage is created with the wefts wrapping again away from each other. And this creates a closed edge, so you don't have any unraveling. Samples of yarn, a few millimeters long, can be mounted on slides for polarized light microscopy to determine the fiber content. The technique works by using directional light, much like in polarized sunglass lenses. The undyed weft sample is shown here at 200 and 400 times magnification on a dark ground. You can see the fairly straight fiber shaft with the regular horizontal nodes that look a bit like a shaft of bamboo. 
This indicates that this particular fiber is linen, which comes from the flax plant. The warp sample on the light ground is curved and appears to have a slightly scaly surface with no horizontal nodes. This indicates the fiber is wool. The scales are a little difficult to see in these images, but I'll show you what I mean on the next slide. The surface structure of wool is similar to our own hair, since wool is the hair of a sheep. So if you run your fingers up a strand of hair, you'll feel resistance from all of the individual scales. On the right, rotating the stage for the microscope under the cross polarizers with a filter in place, which creates both this rainbow striation effect and the pink ground, creates better contrast with the sample allowing us to observe more structural features as illustrated by the rotation of the image. And you can see the color shifting. And all of that is indicative of its composition as wool. This image taken by my colleague, Georgina Rayner, is of a cast from a wool fiber, showing more clearly what I mean by the scaly surface morphology. So this is the same kind of surface you would see in the previous image, but captured a little bit better. The dyed purple fibers are also woolen. This image was taken in visible light without polarization. Although it doesn't show well here, the scaly surface is also present on this sample. Another clue that tells us it's wool is the color of the sample. Linen is dyed less frequently than fibers like wool or silk, which are both all found in textiles from this period. This is because wool and silk are proteins and therefore are chemically more suitable to take color from dyes available at this time. Fibers like linen, which comes from a plant, and cotton, which also comes from a plant, don't take the dye as well and tend to make lighter, duller colors, so they were usually left undyed. Examination of dyes on a different cuff band tells us how colors might have been created. This piece was also woven as a tapestry and again depicts purple animals and roundels with red tongues as accents. Two small samples shown at the bottom here, a few millimeters long each, were taken from the back of the textile for extraction of the dye. The samples are shown at the top here, extracted from the fibers. We've got a pinkish red from the red sample and a reddish purple from the purple sample. Analysis of the extracts tells us which colored molecules are present. This technique is called chromatography and works to separate and identify a mixture of similar compounds. You may be familiar with a simple version of this technique if you've ever tried separating the colors in a marker by using a coffee filter and some water, like shown on the top right. The peaks in the graphic on the bottom here tell us what dyes were used to make the purple color. The components mungistin, anthragalol, pseudopurpurin, alizarin, purpurin, and xanthropurpurin tell us that matter, a red dye, was used. The peaks for ezotin, indigotin, and indirubin show us that indigo, a blue dye, was also used. The results here tell us that the dyer created purple by dyeing the yarn in separate baths of red and then blue. The only true purple available at this time was called Tyrian purple and was, harvested from the shell and was harvested from the glands of shellfish. It was incredibly expensive and reserved really for people of high status or of a particular religious group. So combining these colors was an affordable way to make purple for those who might not have been able to access Tyrian purple but still wanted the color. Matter comes from the roots of a certain species of plants in the genus Rubia. On the left is an 18th century botanical illustration of Dyer's matter. In the center is an image of the plant grown in a botanical garden. On the right here is an example of dried matter roots in the Forbes pigment collection, grown by Edward Forbes in his garden in the 1920s. People learned to cultivate plants that were useful for dyeing rather than just foraging for them, much in the same way that they took care of sheep and raised them to get the fibers to make the textiles. 
This made it possible to obtain more concentrated, better colors than the better colors for dyeing. Indigo comes from indigo dyes come from a few different species of plants. Indigo, shown here in the drawing on the right, is the most famous source. When crushed and mixed with alkaline water, a blue dye can be extracted from the leaves of the plant, as shown here on the bottom left. The dye can then be collected by filtering and dried for later use. An example from the Forbes pigment collection is shown at the top left. Like matter, indigo was a historically significant crop due to its value in dyeing. Some of the exhibition textiles contain gold decorations. The most common use of gold is called filet, where a thin gold foil is wrapped around a yellow yarn and woven into the textile. The weaver could create patterns and accents as long as they took care not to break the thin foil. You can see a sort of lozenge shape here with the underlying yarn peeking through. And then in higher magnification here, you can see the foil in the central core. Another less common use of gold in textiles is gilding, a practice more commonly seen in statues, frames, and paintings. This piece is a cotton ecat with a gold inscription, and the inscription runs here along the fringe of the textile. Ecat is a technique where the yarn is tie-dyed before weaving. Based on where the dyer made the ties, a variety of patterns could be produced. Although dyeing and weaving are usually separate specialties, in the case of ecat, they were probably done by the same person to ensure control over the final product. The inscription on the fringe was made by painting a sticky layer of gum onto the woven fabric, then applying gold leaf over the gum and pressing it into the weave. The characters of the text, which are a little difficult to discern, are made by outlining with a brush in black ink. A small sample of the gilding was taken for further examination. The loose sample is shown here on the right with the gold leaf on top. The fragment was mounted as a cross section and polished so we could see how the leaf and the gum were applied. The top microscope image shows the sample in normal light in the bottom and bright field. You can see from the scale bar, which is 50 micrometers or 50 millionths of a meter, that the sample is very small. On the top, the brown gum is a very thin layer of gold, which you can see there and a little bit here. Analysis showed that the brown adhesive is probably a substance called gum ammoniac, a sticky secretion from plants in the genus Ferula that were harvested in modern day Libya and Iran and a commonly used foundation for gilding. At the left, you can see here, is a piece of cotton fiber that was trapped in the sample and has become polished along with the cross section. Examining the sample using scanning electron microscopy makes it easier to see the gold. This instrument identifies individual elements with heavy, one, heavy ones appearing as brighter than lighter ones. Since the gum and the textile are mostly made out of carbon, they show up as fairly dark. So all of this, is gum, the textile here, and then this is the resin block in the background. Gold, which is a much heavier element, appears as a thin, bright layer at the top of the sample. The scale bar in the image makes it possible for us to approximate the measure, measurement of the leaf thickness, which ranges from 500 to 900 nanometers, and a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. For comparison, the thickness of a standard piece of office paper is about 0.1 millimeters, or roughly 140 times thicker than this gold layer here. I would like to thank my colleagues and collaborators for their support on this project um, in terms of sampling, analysis, and information for the technical study. And I'd also like to thank Lynette and my colleague Matthew Rogan for helping organize this talk. If you're interested in learning more about the textiles examined for this exhibition, there is an article on one of the pieces in our online index magazine. You can also find a recording from a panel for the Textile Society of America Symposium last autumn, where we presented some of our research for the exhibition. 
the exhibition catalog, which contains an essay on the technical study, will be available later this year. We look forward to welcoming you to the museums for the exhibition this coming winter and hope that you have enjoyed learning about the materials and techniques used by medieval Egyptians to create these wonderful textiles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, we already have a couple of questions in the Q&A. And uh, I'm not sure this may be something that is addressed in the index article. I know that the shroud that you showed at the outset from the fifth, sixth century is uh, going to be a pretty prominent part of the exhibition. There was a question about the woven motifs and if you could speak to those. Yes, um, a little bit. So design isn't my specialist area. Are we, is it this one that we're looking at? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I know some of these pieces are um, the cross here. Um, and then this inscription here is in Greek characters. I can't tell you what it means, but it is on the catalog record for the object in our collections online. And if you go to the, um, the YouTube link, I'll have um, the follow-up email include that for the panel talk. My colleague, Katie Taronis is a specialist in interpreting um, sort of the designs of these pieces and she's a lot more knowledgeable than I am. And I, I know that we will have further opportunities to discuss uh, obviously all of the works in the exhibition uh, when the exhibition opens in the new year. So for those of you who are interested in more information and Julie mentioned the forthcoming catalog as well. So lots of opportunities to hear about all of this uh, new research that's been done. Uh, we had a question, which of course gets to a question that I have had myself, because of course I'm a specialist for the art of the 20th century and have spent a number of years, especially thinking about our collection of Bauhaus uh, weavings or um, the artist Vati Werner and our collection and thinking about weaving textiles and gender. And there was a question about whether there's any way of knowing whether the weavers, uh, the medieval Egyptians were men or women? That's also a really good question. And something that um, seems to be kind of variable. Um, a lot of weaving, at least in Europe at the time, was done by men. Um, it seems to probably have been the case in Egypt as well that either men were doing weaving or possibly men and women were doing weaving. Um, that it wasn't necessarily as gender segregated as we tend to think about textile production today being sort of the purview of women or women's work. Um, it is difficult to tell because we don't often know who these people were to begin with. So to a large extent, we rely on documentary evidence describing workshop practice and documents from this period don't tend to survive much in the same way textiles don't. Uh, we have a few specific questions about uh, the weaving process itself. And actually, as you were talking, I thought it was such a wonderful example of a conservation and technical study that you use the opportunity of the damage to actually get in there and, and figure out what's going on. So um, th that's sort of one of my um, favorite parts of our conversations around conservation and the collections is, okay, well, there's this piece that's already broken. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe you can speak also to how minimal um, those uh, samples are. Um, but there were questions about the weave um, and whether the warp of the band is a wrapped warp. In other words, are there selvages at both the top and bottom edges? So I guess this is in reference to the, the piece that you looked at in more um, detail. Yeah, um, so on this particular piece here, the selvages are at the top and bottom. I only show you the bottom since that's where that area of damage is, but they do wrap around as well. And then if you were to look at the verso, which I don't show here, you can see the stitching um, where it would have been attached to the garment piece. And then there's a cut. So basically there's a tiny remnant of the sleeve that it would have been anchored in um, and then an original um, selvage on both. But there are a few pieces that we don't necessarily have a selvage on. Part of the problem is due to that lack of documentation and sort of historical archeological project 
uh, practice. This has been in our collection since 1924. Um, things might have been sort of reconfigured for sale and not necessarily come came to the museum as they were found. So there's a little bit of lost information there. And do we know what type of looms were used? Table looms or other? Probably at this time, uh, most of the pieces would have been woven on a backstrap loom, um, which is kind of basically you could anchor it to a wall or a tree, and then you would have it um, weights and you would either be sitting on it or you would provide tension with your body in some way and work it. I'm not sure how the sort of really large piece um, would have been made if that was just a very large backstrap loom. But in Egypt at this time, and still today, honestly, wood was a fairly scarce resource. So you're not going to have a really large upright frame loom like you're thinking of in terms of European textile production because they just didn't have the materials to build structures like that. Yeah, that actually just answered another one of the questions about whether uh, there are Egyptian techniques that are specific uh, when compared with medieval European weaving. So tapestry appears in both. Um, and if you're thinking of like, you know, the tapestries you'd find uh, that were made at the Gobelins, um, you know, hanging in a castle, it's the same weave structure um, up and down over covering those warps with the tightly packed wefts. Um, there are only so many ways that you can weave a textile. So that's kind of fairly commonplace and it does make it a little bit difficult to sort of tell exactly when or where something was made um, when you only have so many techniques available to study. Uh, you had also spoken about the use of gold and there was a question about whether or not you have come across gold lamella wrapped around leather. I haven't in my own research. Um, we don't really have any sort of leather material in this exhibition. I know that gilt leather has come up before, but I'm not sure if lamella has been used on leather. Um, leather is typically a more hard wearing material. And the thing about the sort of gold wrapping is that it's fairly fragile. So most of the pieces that would have gold and them would not have seen a lot of use. They would have either been ceremonial or for like a formal occasion or decorative. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a wonderful mention, which I think gets to the, the durability um, of uh, perhaps maybe less this work than the, the one that you uh, discussed a little bit later on. Uh, a comment from one of our participants saying that your talk reminded um, them of the Bayou tapestry, an 11th century tapestry repaired in the 19th century, and that when he saw it um, uh, a couple of years ago, the repairs were deteriorating, the 19th century repairs were deteriorating, and yet the original tapestry was still in very good condition. Yeah, um, that's kind of one of the funny parts about con conservation. Um, my colleagues as practical conservators spend a lot of their time undoing and repairing or doing better the treatments that their predecessors have done. Um, conservation is, as we know it, is still a growing field. Um, practice has evolved significantly in the last hundred years. And it's really only been within the last you know hundred years and some change that it's even been a field. So with objects like this cuff band, um, it would have been excavated and, and prepared for sale basically to be aesthetically pleasing. Whereas today we would, if we excavated something, we would keep it as intact as possible. So a lot of, I worked in a department for textile conservation for a number of years and the students there um, spent a lot of time just assessing previous treatments, reversing treatments, all of that. So. Hopefully in the future, our successors won't have to do as much as people today are doing now. Well, we have a number of other questions and also praise um, for your talk, Julie, about how it really was a wonderful um, and accessible uh, talk about conservation. And I know that's um, always a challenge for us laypersons uh, who don't have the science or in this case, uh, the weaving background. Uh, so I think we're going to wrap it up there. But uh, if you did put a question in the chat and we didn't get a chance to get to it, we will forward those questions 
uh, on to our speaker. And uh, I'm sure that she will be uh, more than happy to, to reach out and, and be in touch. And stay tuned um, as uh, the opening of the exhibition approaches to more programming uh, online about um, social fabrics, uh, which we're very excited to open next uh, January at the Harvard Art Museums. And I just want to uh, thank Julie again uh, for her wonderful talk and remind you um, that you will get a short online survey after we're finished here today, which uh, we do hope you'll take a minute to complete it. It's very helpful for us to uh, continue to get your feedback about our art talk series. And I hope you can join us in two weeks time on Tuesday, June 29th for the next talk, which is actually um, one that I'm giving on German Expressionist painters and their frames and a project that we did in advance of the reopening of the Harvard Art Museums in 2014 to return the paintings to, to historic replica frames and get as close to the artist's original intent as possible. And of course, you can always visit our online calendar for more information about this and our other programs, which will continue throughout the summer. So thank you again, Julie, and thank so many of you for joining us today. Thanks everyone.